This is Spite. She is an all carbon fiber, incredibly supersonic, minimum diameter rocket I built last year instead of going to therapy like a normal person. It's some of my best fabrication work, in my opinion, and she flew to 23,000 feet at Mach 2.2. But what I didn't expect to get hit with when I posted that video was this. And now that the question's been asked, yeah, that's a great freaking question. Let's talk about it. If the rocket really was going at the speed of Mach 2.2, why on earth could you not hear a sonic boom? Well, I'm gonna answer that question and a bunch of other related questions because today, teacher mode Zyla is activated. Actually, I'm gonna take these off because I already have my contact lenses in. Whew. Okay, so what even is a sonic boom? You've likely heard the term tossed around in reference to planes and rockets and the occasional hedgehog breaking Mach 1, or the speed of sound. But what's the speed of sound? If we're talking numbers, in air, it's 332 meters per second. In water, it's 1,496 meters per second. And in steel, it's 5,940 meters per second. To give you a sense of how fast that last one is, that means if you had a single steel beam that stretched the entire 29 mile width of the city of Los Angeles and you tapped it on one end, the sound would reach the other side in just seven seconds. Since this is a YouTube science -y explainer video, we're gonna have to take yet another step back to an even more fundamental question in order to make sense of all of this. What exactly is sound? Well, in physics, sound is a vibration that propagates as an acoustic wave through a transmission medium such as gas, liquid, or solid. In human physiology and psychology, sound is the reception of those waves by the brain. There's a few key things to note in that definition. First and foremost is the vibration and the wave parts of the definition. Which is to say, sound is not just any sort of particles moving willy-nilly in a medium. It specifically has to be a wave. And as such, it has all of the usual wave stuff going on. Frequency, amplitude, sun-kissed surfer dudes. Oh, not, not that one? It's a bummer. Which in the case of sound waves equates to things like pitch and volume. The experience of this wave as sound by the human ear is also a non-trivial thing. Things like perceived volume can get a little complicated and how the experience of sound relates to the physics of sound can even start to get philosophical. If a tree falls in the woods at Mach 2, does it even make a sonic boom? The answer is yes, because the wildlife was scared shitless. Anyway, my point is, the speed of sound waves is a fundamental property of the substance that it's moving through. Basically, it's the result of the chemical structure of that substance. And for the rest of the video, that substance is just gonna be air. So to sum it up, all sound waves moving through air move at the same speed, which means that yelling louder means the sound can reach someone who is further away, but it won't reach them any faster than a whisper would. And if someone could please tell my Jewish grandmother that, that would be great. Thanks. So now that we've established that all sound waves travel through the air at the same speed, let's ask the question of what happens if you force the particles to move faster than that fundamental speed, say by flying a really fast rocket through it. Well, by definition, the resultant movement of the particles wouldn't even really be sound anymore. Since the particles are being forced to move faster than a wave can propagate, the phenomenon isn't a sound wave anymore. It's just a bunch of particles and pressure and energy getting squished together into what we call a shock wave. The reason this happens is because when you're moving faster than the speed of sound, the sound waves that you would normally be making don't get a chance to form. And instead, you're basically smashing through the air faster than you can vibrate it. And the particles don't have a chance to get out of the way or radiate outwards as they normally would at lower speeds. And it would be irresponsible of me to talk about this without bringing up the Doppler effect, which is that thing that happens when a race car zips by you super duper fast and it goes Wheel! and the perceived frequency of sound waves being produced by it is either increased or decreased as the object moves towards or away from you respectively. And the derivation of the resulting frequency is actually pretty easy to derive. Here's the equation for the case where the object producing the sound is approaching you, since that's the one that's gonna be relevant for us in this video. Note that when the speed of the source equals the speed of the sound, the denominator in that equation goes to zero, which would effectively make the frequency go to infinity. Or really, it just makes the frequency undefined. It also makes the math gods mad at you, and we don't like that. The frequency being undefined makes perfect sense, since like we said earlier, at that speed, the movement isn't a wave anymore. It's a jumble that looks more like the security line at LaGuardia, so of course it doesn't have a well-defined frequency. Here's this picture that puts it all together. As the speed of the object increases, first we see the Doppler effect, and then here's the moment when the velocity reaches Mach 1 and then it exceeds Mach 1. 
Now you see the sound is compressed into this cone-shaped shockwave, and that is our sonic boom. If you're standing in place as something traveling at supersonic speeds passes by overhead, first you won't hear anything. Then you'll hear the boom and feel the pressure shift right as the shockwave passes by. And then you'll hear the sound of the object as it moves away from you at a lower frequency because of the usual Doppler effect. And now everybody listen up so I can wipe away a common misconception from your brains. There is not just a boom at the precise moment when something goes supersonic. That boom will be booming as long as the speed is above Mach 1. It's just that any given observer only experiences the boom at the one specific moment when it passes them by. And actually, while we're clearing up misconceptions, here's another big one. The visual that we see that looks like a shockwave is actually not that. No matter what your hippie aunt told you, you can't actually see sounds. It's just water condensation due to the sharp drop in temperature in the air just behind certain parts of a supersonic object, usually the wings of a jet. And the temperature drops because the supersonic movement creates a pocket of low-density air traveling behind the high-density region where the high-density shockwave is. In that low-density and low-temperature region, you get a rapid condensation as water gets like squeezed out by the air, which is what we're looking at here. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first and probably last ever Sonic Boom Awards, the Boomies. Our first award goes to the loudest sonic boom ever recorded. And the Boomie goes to... The Space Shuttle Discovery. The loudest sonic boom ever recorded was produced by the Space Shuttle Discovery during its re-entry into Earth's atmosphere in 1991 reaching a peak level of over 200 decibels. Next up on the boomies, we have the smallest sonic boom. And the boomie goes to... Whip cracks. Whip cracks are known to create tiny little sonic booms caused by the end of the whip moving at supersonic speeds. Whip it good. Our next award, the most common sonic boom. And the boomie goes to... Thunder! When lightning occurs in the atmosphere, the amount of energy moving around results in rapid temperature change that actually makes the air move at supersonic speeds. So during a thunderstorm, you're actually hearing a whole bunch of sonic booms. And our last boomy of the evening goes to the weirdest sonic boom. And the boomy goes to... Dinosaurs? Okay, this last one is admittedly not confirmed, but some paleontologists believe that the tail of the Apatosaurus louisae might have actually been capable of being swung around so fast that the end of the tail exceeded the speed of sound and created defensive sonic booms. Literal dynamite. And that's all for the boomies. Stick around after the break for more on sonic booms. I don't know if you guys remember my Zen Garden video, but one of the things I needed to build it was an adjustable regulator hose, like for a grill. And I looked up online literally once to see where I could purchase one, and right after that, I started getting sidebar ads everywhere for fancy new grills from websites I had never heard of. And you know what? It kind of got me, and I'm feeling a little bit grill insecure now. It turns out that thousands of companies are collecting and profiting off your personal data without you even knowing. You can request the removal of your information, but reaching out to so many companies individually can take hours. Which brings us to today's sponsor, Incogni. Incogni helps you protect your privacy by reaching out to data brokers on your behalf, requesting your personal data removal and dealing with their objections. Earlier this month, I signed up for a free newsletter from a sketchy circuit board supplier for a discount, maybe not my best idea. And right after that, I started getting spam emails from other manufacturers that I had never subscribed to. However, since I started using Incogni, the volume of these spam messages has gone way down. Incogni has sent 357 removal requests to data brokers who had my information, and I never even had to lift a finger, and I can track the entire process through my dashboard. Incogni can make your online experience so much better, and now is the perfect time for you guys to try it out. So go to incogni.com slash foxlin and use code foxlin to get an exclusive offer of 60% off. That's incogni.com slash foxlin and use code foxlin or click the link below to take your personal data off the market. Okay, let's get back to our exploration of sonic booms. We know what causes them and what they're like, but where exactly do you need to be to experience one? Well, like I said, you need to be in the path of the shockwave. Specifically, if you're on the ground as a supersonic object flies overhead, then the path of the shockwave on the ground is called the boom carpet. And now, the question which inspired this video in the first place. Why the heck did I put shitty pop music over the launch of Spite in my video? Because I liked it at CNNW3929, okay? Just kidding. The real question, 
Why was there no sonic boom if spite was going at Mach 2.2 or more than double the speed of sound? Well, in simplest terms, it's because we weren't in the right spot to hear it. I tragically do not yet have the ability to hover silently with an audio recorder at 400 meters. You aren't in the boom carpet and won't ever hear a boom if you start behind the object before it even goes supersonic. And if the object is flying straight up, the shockwave won't ever hit the ground at all. So there really is no boom carpet. Maybe a boom magic carpet though. Look, if we take our image from earlier and turn it vertical, we see our rocket take off and at some moment it goes supersonic above us. That's when the booming starts and the shockwave starts spreading out around the rocket. In this case, Spite went supersonic at a height of just over 250 meters, reached its top speed of Mach 2.2 at a height of 1700 meters, and dropped back below Mach 1 at a height of about 4,500 meters. The formula for the angle of the shockwave cone is sine alpha equals one over the Mach number, which was 2.2 for spike. So in our case, that means at our top speed, the shockwave angle was roughly 27 degrees. So spike was producing a sonic boom that looked a little something like this. But wait, Zyla, I was alive in 1991 and got to hear the record setting sonic boom from the Space Shuttle Discovery with my own ears. Well, aren't you lucky? How's your back feeling? But for real, you're right. We can sometimes hear booms from space shuttles for a few different reasons. Either because the angle at which the shuttles were traveling through the atmosphere while supersonic wasn't actually vertical, or because we hear booms of the rockets not on the way up, but as they're dropping back down to Earth at supersonic speeds. In which case, the shockwave is moving towards the ground, not away from it. I've actually gotten to hear one from a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch right as the booster comes back down to land at Vandenberg. But overall, given the angle, the size, and conditions, a model rocket launch, no matter how big and sexy the rocket, is just not gonna result in a boom that you could experience from the ground. But wait, there's more. All this sonic boom talk and research got me wondering, are there other analogous booms, like of the non-sonic variety? And it turns out the answer is yes, and it's super freaking cool. First, we've got Cherenkov radiation. This is essentially a sonic boom, but for light, which becomes possible when a charged particle is moving through a medium faster than the speed of light in that medium. And yes, light apparently can be made to move slower through certain materials, but that's a topic for another day. It's this phenomenon which gives underwater nuclear reactors that trademark spooky blue glow. There's also something called a super shear earthquake where the fault line in an earthquake actually moves faster than the vibrations it causes in the earth. And this situation is perfectly analogous to a sonic boom, but instead of through air, it's going through the ground and causes what is called a ground vibration boom, which has been known to completely pulverize rocks up to miles away from the fault line. Scary stuff. Lastly, I wanna close this video with a shout out to a really awesome lady. Her story was one of the ones chronicled in the book Hidden Figures. Dr. Christine Darden was a mathematician, data analyst, and aeronautical engineer who devoted much of her 40 year career in aerodynamics at NASA to researching supersonic flight and the physics of sonic booms. As you might imagine, we barely scratched the surface in this video. So if you're interested in diving deeper, Dr. Darden's work is a really cool place to start. And you may have noticed I tried something new with this video. As you know, if you're already a fan of this channel, most of my content focuses on me making things and building things, which is great because it's what I love to do and what drew me to engineering in the first place. But one thing I sometimes regret is that often I skip over some of the fundamental science concepts or like engineering processes and decisions or just cool theoretical stuff that relates to a lot of what's going on in my builds. So I thought I'd give it a try here, but obviously with animations and fact checking and whatnot, these videos are kind of expensive to produce. So if you liked it, please, please let me know down in the comments below and let me know what other topics you'd like me to explore. And if you like rockets and boomy booms, be sure to subscribe. See ya.